You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing the 12th Doctor story, the second part of the Zygon series, The Zygon Inversion. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hey, Father Corey. How's it going? Folks, remember to like The Secrets of Doctor Who on Facebook, where we're at facebook.com slash secrets of Doctor Who. You can retweet us on Twitter, where we're at SQPN, and leave us comments wherever you find us. We'd love to hear from you. And I want to tell you about another show on the StarQuest Network you are sure to enjoy called Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. You can find that wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash mysterious. So we are talking about the Zygon inversion. And uh, Jimmy, can you give us a recap of what happens in this one? This week, the Zygon ceasefire is on the verge of breaking down. Bonnie, the leader of the Zygon rebels, tries to shoot the doctor's plane out of the sky. But Clara, still inside of her Zygon pod, starts interfering with Bonnie's actions, and the Doctor and Osgood are able to parachute away from the exploding plane to safety. Afterwards, Clara is able to surreptitiously send the Doctor a text to let him know that she's alive. With Clara's help, the Doctor and Osgood are able to track Bonnie back to her base in London. Kate Stewart also shows up, having defeated the Zygon who was threatening her in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Bonnie's goal is to get the Osgood box that will end the ceasefire. She believes that it will unmask every Zygon on Earth for an hour. However, she discovers that there are two boxes, a red one and a blue one, and the second box will release Harry Sullivan's Zygon-killing gas and destroy all the Zygons. But each, button ha- but each box has two buttons labeled Truth or Consequences. Bonnie takes one box and Kate Stewart takes the other. The Doctor realize, reveals that the two boxes are a scale model of war. Nobody knows which button will produce which outcome, just as when you start a war, you never know who will survive and who will die. He then makes an impassioned speech about his role in the Time War, and he eventually convinces both Kate and Bonnie to back away from the brink of war so the ceasefire stands. Afterwards, Bonnie takes the place of the second Osgood, the one that Missy killed, and the two Osgoods resume their roles as protectors of the peace. The end. All right, and uh, so let's start with our overall impressions. Father Corey, what did you think of this one? You know, it, it, it's all right. It's a good one. You know, obviously it's well known for the, the, the long speech by the doctor about war and, you know, and good points made in that speech. But it, otherwise, it's, you know, it's a good conclusion to the, the, the two-parter and kind of a, a resolution. They kind of keep the, the secrets of the Osgoods up, you know, which is the human, which is the, the Zygon and all that. It, it, it's okay. I mean, it, and second watch, it doesn't hold up as much to me as it did. I really enjoyed it the first time because of the whole, the, the, the whole issue with the war, war and all that. But it, it doesn't quite hold up as much for me. But it's still, I still enjoy it. It's just mm-hmm. not. I don't enjoy as much as I did the first time. How about you, Jimmy? I thought it was uh, better than I remembered from seeing it before. Um, It's enjoyable. A lot of it is uh, moody and atmospheric and interesting. Um, There's some really nice sequences like where early on Osgood and the doctor are talking and the doctor believes Clara is dead. And Osgood is functioning like a highly competent companion. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in fact, she's the one that puts it all together that Clara is not dead. Um, but even before that, she is talking to the doctor uh, about in, in a very knowledgeable way that normally it would take a companion a long time to get to, you know, like she's saying, if, if, if I were going to invade the earth, the first thing I would do is kill you. You know, I I wouldn't even let you start talking because that's what you do. Just bang one shot and you'd be dead. In fact, I'd do it 12 times if necessary. Mm-mm. And the doctor is like, you really <laughs> thought this through, haven't you? Because <laughs> she's a fan. That's yeah, what we yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I enjoyed that. I thought that, you know, the the war speech was handled better than... It could have been. It's certainly better than anything that would have come out of the 13th Doctor's mouth. It's not the same thing. <laughs> um, at the same time, it um, it's a little wobbly on logical grounds because it, 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 it's not clear what the story is about what the boxes will do. 
you know, we've been told one box will unmask every Zygon for an hour and the other box will kill every Zygon. But then it turns out they both have two buttons. And clearly there are four options here, depending on which of the four options, which of the four buttons get pressed. And the, the, it's never clear what the other two options are. No, they, they make, no, no, hang on. Okay. I, they make a stab at saying what they are, but it goes by so fast in dialogue that I wasn't able to catch it and mm. didn't, and didn't want to go back and rewatch it. They should on the writing level have hammered what the four options are more clearly. Okay. Um, so I thought that was a little wobbly. Also Bonnie for a, let it all hang out. Zygon rebel leader spends a remarkable amount of time in human form. Mm. Uh, mm. It's like, what's up with that? Um, I, if I were Bonnie and had this, I must show myself to the world ethic, I would show myself at every opportunity. You know, I mean, I might need to impersonate Clara momentarily uh, to get past a security sensor or something. But other than that, I would be in Zygon form. So that was inconsistent to my mind. Also her turnaround to becoming the second super Osgood who's super committed to the cause of peace is, is a little quick. Um, Mm -hmm. so I thought those were some flaws, but overall Mm -hmm. it was an enjoyable episode that had a bunch of enjoyable parts. So for me, uh, I I I really enjoyed this. I liked um, I liked it. I really liked it the first time. Um, the humor, the, the the quippiness, you know, the 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 Moffat characteristics of uh, the quippy dialogue was fun. There were some really nice lines in there. I really like Osgood and the Doctor together, um, and I love that Osgood is a fan stand-in. She is a Doctor mm-hmm. Who fan, like you know, in universe. Of course, but still, it's what we would be like. Yes, you know, what I, what I, and I would say we in the collective fandom sense. Yeah, I would totally kill the Doctor instantly twelve times as well if I were <laughs> invading the Earth. Or at least I would tell him that's how I would do it because that's what we that's what we do every episode, right? Yep. We talk mm-hmm. about all of the things and the logical inconsistencies and why the villains shouldn't monologue. And we, we this is the sort of thing we do here. And so I love that that sort of breaks the fourth wall a tiny little bit. It at least scratches called- it. It's called pounding on the fourth wall. <laughs> okay, yeah. and uh, and so the uh, that was fun. I, I like I loved seeing Oz Osgood, uh, one of my favorite guest characters, um, and I thought it was interesting seeing Jenna Coleman. Uh, I agree that Bonnie should have discarded the human form more often, especially when Clara was taking control <laughs> because mm-hmm. she was in the form. That would have I would assume have undone that, uh, maybe not, but I liked. Jenna Coleman's acting in this, playing the evil doppelganger who has to, we have to see her almost uh, without any dialogue. We have to see in her face, in her expressions as she's changing and that in that, that big climactic scene. And so I, I liked Jenna Coleman in this one. I thought that was really good. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I, I just, and I loved the, I loved the, the speech. I, 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 there was so much in that that I was like, right on. I mean, it, it's like you say, it's not one hundred percent perfect, but there are so many things in that. Throw I kept like writing it down the quotes because I'm like, yes, that that's a, it's a really good point. Uh, you know about war and the doctor knows about war because he's been in war and you know and had, as to his mind, killed all his his people. So, or almost I really did until Clara rewrote his history. Yes, Mm -hmm. right. So, but by the way, one thing that occurs to me is this: um, this this episode is sort of a like the boxes are a scale model of war. This this episode is a scale model of Day of the Doctor, because Mm -hmm. in Day of the Doctor, the solution to the conflict between human and Zygons is you don't know which side you're on. Right. And here, the solution to the conflict between the humans and the Zygon rebels is you don't know which button does which effect. Right. right, yeah. The and to kind of close loop on that, um, I, I I did catch what they the the dialogue on that, and so it was like one for Kate's box, one button kills the Zygons, and the second one uh, detonates a nuclear device underneath the Tower of London, destroys London. Uh, Bonnie's box, one button unmasks every Zygon, but the other makes them permanently keep their shape. Right, and so it's these two opposite effects that they're having to, you know, and. 
it, it's that gamble. Are you are you willing to take the risk? And that's the gamble of war, right? And yeah. ultimately, it's revealed both boxes are empty and do nothing. Yep. Which, and they've actually but, been doing this fifteen times already. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Um, but Kate's memory has been blanked each time, and so has the memory of all Zygons except those who were Osgood or directly involved so that people don't realize the boxes have no effect and thus the boxes can serve as a firewall mm -hmm. to keep the peace. It's a, it's a costly bluff because every time they go through this 15 times, apparently I'm guessing people die <laughs> and do they not remember like all of the previous like no, stuff? The, leading the, well, up the to idea, it? well, the idea is that they don't realize the boxes don't do anything. That's they the actually, only thing they don't remember, right? So yeah. no, so I mean, up to this point, you know, they've been sitting there fifteen times, you know, because every time they push a button, see, this oh. is one of the complaints about writing that I do have is they don't make it clear. Oh, fifteen times they pushed a button, or fourteen times they pushed a button in that particular conflict. They finally, shut it. Oh. Okay. I okay. interpreted it as there have been 15, not that there were 15 forget-me-nots in the, or, you know, 15 incidents in the course of this one story. I interpreted that to mean this scenario has run 15 times before. That's what I thought, but See, but it makes more sense if it's they've pushed the button 15 times in this scene. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, and he's see, kept racing their memory about, that's, about it. That's that's where I like again. I complain about writing is they didn't make I didn't make it clear because I read it as no, they've gone through this loop in this room at mm -hmm. this time fifteen times. I I also would criticize the writing in that the number fifteen is excessively high. I would have yeah. if 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 I would have been the doctor, that's, I would have said three the last three times we did this. That's that's a moffatism though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everything We've over complained the top. about that plenty of times. <laughs> by, by the way, another aspect of this that I think is is wobbly on the writing level is it is not clear who which Zygons are aware of their status as Zygons. Um, you know, initially we have this so we have this opening scene where Clara it wakes up and she's in her mind and we but it's pictured as her apartment. Yeah. And it's creepy and she starts interacting with the television and she sees Bonnie shooting at the plane and she's able to cause the first shot to miss and then the second shot hits it and the doctor and Osgood parachute away and apparently everybody else on that plane died and didn't even mm -hmm. get a word of condolence. Mm. Um, just no mention of anybody else on the, you know, the entire flight crew was just killed and the doctor and Osgood don't even notice that. Um, but then we switch to this invasion of the body snatchers scene where you have, uh, a, a guy who's, who's in distress kind of running, you know, loping in, in London and he's, he's, he's heading into a building, but he's passing all of these people who are just sitting there passively, who are all Zygons. And mm -hmm. they're all, but they look like humans, and they're all sitting there, and they're not doing anything. They're just sitting passively. While one guy who's a street sweeper is sweeping up electrically crackling piles of, of fluff that used to be human beings. Mm -hmm. And this is very much the 1978 invasion of the body snatchers um, yeah. where you have at, at the garbage men are in on it. They're taking away human fluff remains. Um, you know, so they've obviously already become pod people and the pod people are just very passive and quiet and don't really do anything aggressive most of the time, but can suddenly lurch out. And at the end you have, you know, uh, two characters seemingly walking among the pod people by pretending to be pod people, and but they're surrounded by all of these, you know, invaders that have taken over their world. And so this is very much like 1978 Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And then Bonnie zaps this guy, and she she's she we don't realize he's a Zygon. Mm -hmm. He he looks human, but Bonnie says, "I know what you are." And you're going to be the first, which in context doesn't make any sense because if you're thinking he's a human, we've just seen piles of human refuse. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but then she like puts her fingers to his temples and zaps him. And that starts his transformation back into a Zygon. And we realize he's a Zygon. And that's what she meant by you're the first, you're the one who's going to show everybody, namely that Zygons are living among humans. And so she does a video of him transforming back into a Zygon and posts it online so people can see the truth. Um, but then when Clara and Osgood encounter this same guy, he's still unstable. He's transforming back and forth between human and Zygon in kind of a, a mixed intermediate state. And he's very distressed. And it seems that he knows that he's a Zygon, but he's made Earth his home. And mm-hmm. he's like, this is my home. I just want to live here. And now my life has been destroyed. And he ends up zapping himself to death. Um, so he seems to know he's a Zygon at least after Bonnie zapped him. But we know other Zygons have been fully aware that they're Zygons the whole time, like the two little girls from the previous episode. But then later in this episode, when they're having the box sequence, the doctor implies that it seems to imply that the Zygons don't know that they're that they're not human. And so I'm guessing some of them know and some of them don't if mm. I put the pieces together. But but that's remember that. really yeah. that's really weird if that's the case. Why would some of them know and some of them not? And I, and I didn't get the feeling that they didn't know they were Zygons. They just didn't want to be Zygons or, you know, in, in the appearance of Zygons. Yeah. Well, I got the... But that they knew they, who they were. Like, this guy knew that she was a Zygon and that he was a Zygon. Yeah. And was running away from her because of that. Right. There's some line in the middle of the doctor's speech about not the Zygons not knowing who they are. At least that's how I heard it. But mm. I have a bit of a don't go back and and rewatch, re-listen to things policy because yeah. I'm trying to put myself in the perspective of the ordinary viewer who doesn't typically go back and frame by frame and reanalyze everything. Um, and it's a writing flaw to my mind if if a line goes by so quickly that the ordinary viewer doesn't have time to process it. Yeah, see I didn't I don't even I didn't even hear that line, but I would I guess I would take it as they don't know who they are, kinda like they've lost their course, they've lost their way more than they've that would forgotten be another Zygons. That know? would be another possible interpretation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't remember that. So, um, well, in any oh, case, um, by, the, by the way, I, I also yeah. like the callback to day of the doctor where yeah. the doctor in explaining how Clara changed his own history says there was another box. I was going to press another button mm-hmm. and he's thinking of the moment, the time right, yeah. weapon that the, that he, he originally used until history changed. Right. When he was the war doctor. Uh, with the rose yep. simulacrum, yeah, that was that was good. Uh, I'm glad they made that callback to that. And I mean, this is really a sequel to yeah. that. That and version. the Osgood box looks a lot like the moment. It does. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure some fan has a replica of it on a on a desk somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I I did like that opening scene with Clara in her apartment using the Dutch angles to kind of say mm-hmm. something's not right here, and mm-hmm. and as she discovers what's going on, um, Clara in the Zygon pod reminded me a lot of Oswin in the mm-hmm. Dalek uh, mm-hmm. uh, episode, you know where we where we saw Jenna Coleman as Oswin. So that, that was at least she didn't turn out to be as a, a Dalek this time, <laughs> right? Uh, it's also interesting that uh, she makes. Bonnie miss with the 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 uh, service to air missile, although that's not how they work. Um, no, <laughs> but uh, th- that that was interesting. And um, Osgood pointing out that the doctor's sonic spectacles is like a visual hearing aid. Yeah, <laughs> that was good. A- and I like the doctor's comeback. He says, "I once invented an invisible watch. Spot the design flaw." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, and then she—that's when she says, you, "You know, oh, you're you're talking nonsense to distract me from being scared. That's something you do a lot, <laughs> which, is, yeah. which is actually that goes all the way back. I mean, Second Doctor uh, mm-hmm. did that, so that was good. Um, oh, speaking of earlier Doctors, did you notice that the safe in the mm-hmm. unit safe house was behind a portrait of the First Doctor? Yes, yep. that was fun. Um, so. We have this scene where 
uh, Clara and Bonnie, also known as Zy- Zygella, um, they're they're kind of having this uh, truth or truth or lie moment where she's using the heartbeat, Clara's heartbeat, and Bonnie's heartbeat as a li- kind of lie detector. They can detect when each other's lying. Does the heartbeat yeah, not, really make no. it good? <laughs> no. That if if it was if you could that we can never lie to each other because we have synced heartbeats. Okay, well then, if our heartbeats are really synced, then right. then they're going to reflect both of our emotional states, not just mm-hmm. one of ours. So how do you tell which is which? Mm. But even even setting that issue aside, um. What it needed to be was, I can feel your heartbeat and you can feel mine. But even setting that aside, um, the heart rate heart rate is not a good proxy for is someone lying or not. <laughs> That's even it's only one of the measures that mm-hmm. modern lie detectors use, and modern lie detectors are junk. <laughs> so yes. so this is not a good lie detector. Yes, See, uh, check, what, check out that episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on why light detectors are junk. Yep. See, what I would have done in that situation is, oh, fine, you can feel my heartbeat. I'm going to start running laps around my couch. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Oh, my heart rate's <laughs> accelerated. Well, that's because I'm running laps around my couch. It's not because I'm lying. Uh, now, Prove the, it otherwise. The logic <laughs> is faulty, but, I, but the dr- dramatic idea is that Clara right. will get Bonnie to do what she wants by telling her truth, truthful things, and mm-hmm. and the audience can know that they are truthful, and I kind of like that. I like the idea that she mm-hmm. manipulates her into doing the thing that needs to be done by being truthful to her. Well, and it's uh, it's also this idea that the person being duplicated can influence the Zygon, yeah. and it's just you know that's something we don't see because always the Zygon using the person who's. Uh, mm-hmm duplicated but clara has the awareness of saying hey i can influence this i can do something to to change it even just a little bit that was new on the show and i like that addition to zygon mythology that the Mm -hmm. the victim if the victim becomes conscious or is dreaming can influence what the zygon does that's that's having the connection the link between them work both ways that's new to the show and i like that Mm -hmm. that that Mm -hmm. makes it more interesting now, now, can you imagine trying to text with, without actually looking at the phone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at, at, at least they kept it short. I was afraid yeah. it was going to be much longer than that. I, I would uh, guess if you're tw- in your 20s, that's probably a, a skill you have. <laughs> well, now, if you had the old phones where it was the T9, where you, you, know, you use the one to nine buttons and you push them multiple times, that would be easy. Yeah, yeah. Using a modern where you don't have the tactile feedback, not so much. <laughs> the... Um, also, one thing about the oh, I'm blanking on it now. Um, oh yeah, uh, Clara's truthfulness. Mm-hmm. So Clara says that the that the box has a button that will unmask every Zygon for an hour. But and then she said, and and Bonnie's like, great, now I'm going to kill you. And Clara's like, nope. Once you learn what everything that's happening here, you're going to want to talk to me again. So you better mm-hmm. keep me alive. And that's a nice move. But Clara doesn't know that the boxes don't do anything. There's an inconsistency in the writing there because Maybe Clara, her- if if this lie detector thing is true, yeah, I mean you could say the doctor lied to Clara and mm-hmm. led her to believe this, but um, you you but that's that's one solution. Another solution is Clara's just a really good liar and realizes this heartbeat <laughs> thing is la- is a lousy test. That's um, Danny. <laughs> yeah, and. <laughs> And that would be my preferred solution. But notice you, a solution of some kind is required here because there is an inconsistency between what Clara says and what the re- truth that's ultimately revealed is. Right. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but I do wonder, like, if Clara, if her, Clara herself has had her memory about, so that only the doctor knows what's really right. and in the, the boxes. Oscars. And the Oscars, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kate, speaking of Kate Stewart, uh, she pulled a, a Zygon trick by pretending to be a Zygon lo- mm-hmm. who looks like Kate and shows up from New Mexico. And we Again, get her just hu- like in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, passing as the yep. enemy. Yep. And she uh, he asks her how she survived. 
and five rounds rapid, which yeah. is a, which is a nice callback to the, the the brigadier. That was good. There are some really nice callbacks in this. We have um, we have five round ra- five rounds rapid. We have other things. One of them is the doctor in referring to the Z sixty seven gas that's supposed to be in the box. He refers to it as the imbeciles gas, and that's a callback all the way back to it's um, the the gold moon episode from early in the fourth doctor's time i'm blanking right. on the name of the story but it's right at the beginning of the fourth doctor's time where they go to this golden asteroid and oh, right. and the the doctor and harry sullivan are carrying bombs to the center of it and harry does something that could potentially have set one of the bombs off and the fourth doctor rolls on his back and says Harry Sullivan is an imbecile. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I remember that. <laughs> well, I, I like, uh, you know, she's wearing a, Oscar's wearing a shirt with the question marks and she goes, well, you used to also wear, always wear question marks. Why don't you do that anymore? And he, Dr. goes, what makes you think I'm not? Yeah, right. Question well, mark that was, underwear. Yeah, that, I think that was last time. Last the, 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 oh, was well, that last, last time? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. thought it was this time, but yeah. So one thing that occurred to me is what would, what would things be like if there were no boxes? Like, how do the boxes preserve the peace? If they didn't have the boxes... They provide an outlet for... Um, they create a, a focus of attention. Okay. If, if Kate, if Unit and the Zygons believe that these boxes will have such dramatic consequences, then they will seek them out when a conflict is brewing mm. and that conflict will that after they've found them that that gives the doctor a chance to talk everybody off the ledge so right. that's how they keep the peace people believe that there are these boxes that if they were used would cause horrible things to happen so we must never use them we must never break the peace and if anybody gets the idea to break the peace the first thing they're going to do is seek out the boxes and that gives Osgood a chance to alert the doctor and the doctor can come in and talk everybody down. So in a sense, they're kind of working as mutually assured destruction. Yes. Bluffs. Mm-hmm. It's the mm-hmm. nuclear weapon bluffs. Yep. Uh, uh, which is kind of an interesting approach. Um, I'm not sure that would work in the, <laughs> with, with nuclear weapons, but, but in this case, it, 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 it works. Well, it kind of did with nuclear weapons because Kate thought one of the buttons set off a <laughs> nuclear weapon. So <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the, the speech, the doctor's speech in this. There's been some interesting things I want to point out. And maybe you guys have things you want to point out too. Um, when Bonnie declares, we've been treated like cattle. And the doctor says, and, and that's disputable, right? But, says, no, you haven't. You've been granted citizenship. Yeah, or exa- right. We don't uh, do but that the doctor cattle. says, he doesn't argue against it. He just says, so what? And she says, it's not fair. And he says, life isn't fair. I was waiting for princess, but, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, I can't imagine, like you mentioned earlier, Jimmy, the 13th doctor saying anything like that. Like life isn't fair. Deal with it. Like the universe isn't, isn't here to be fair. And I thought that was an interesting response of, yeah, there's suffering and bad things happen. And, you know, your life isn't a bed of roses. So what? Live in the real world. Live in the world that you have. Or Make the best of what go- you got. Go buy yourself a bed of roses if you want to lie in one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The doctor but, never promised him a rose garden. <laughs> that's right. Um, the The doctor also says, and this was a line that, that resonated with me, and I, I'm curious if it resonated with you. The only way anyone can live in peace is if they're prepared to forgive. So why don't you break mm-hmm. the cycle? And I'm like, wow. I mean, if you have an encapsulation of, in my I, from my point of view, an encapsulation of the Christian view of, of how to live in peace. That's it. I mean, peace comes from love and forgiveness. Yeah. I had in my notes, the doctor preaching forgiveness, and that's a a good spiritual aspect of the show. There's also in this episode, there's also an earlier line where the doctor is talking with Osgood and, and he says, I'm more than 2000 years old. I'm old enough to be your Messiah. And that's (laughs) just, that's just a joke. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So it's not really, he's not really claiming to be the Messiah. He's just, being a being, being silly. a smart aleck that yeah, <laughs> yeah. jesus lived two thousand years ago yeah yeah but i i really like that like the that he encapsulated in this is that idea of forgiveness is mm. and it's not like a 
namby pamby forgiveness. I mean, I think he's in in this like it's as if it's easy. I think he's acknowledging in this whole speech how hard it is to forgive. It's not easy to let go of the hurt and the pain and the suffering and say I forgive you. I mean, it it can be a platitude to say, "Oh, you just forgive the people who persecute you and move on." And I don't think the doctor is saying that. I think he's saying, "Yep, it, uh, you know, you've had a tough tough road to hoe." Exactly. He also talks about his own motivation in this and says he's doing this so no one else will ever have to live like this, like him again. No one mm-hmm. else will ever have to feel this pain. And that's right. kind of the clincher in his argument that gets Kate to close the box, and then Bonnie also closes her box. And right. Bonnie then says, it's empty, isn't it? Both boxes. There's nothing in them. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um but one, one part about this, about it, I like is he talks about, you know, of course, Bonnie's, she's, you know, she's got the revolution going. She's going to, you know, turn, mm-hmm. turn over the world for the Zygons. And then he said, doctor says, well, how are you going to protect your glorious revolution from the next one? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You that know? was my and next that's always <laughs> That's always a question when you hear of people trying to turn over the world and make the world in their image. And, and yeah, but what's going to happen when you're the one who's up against the wall and the next revelation, revolution is overturning you? Right. That's why so many revolutions become totalitarian and mm-hmm. authoritarian uh, after they're successful so that it doesn't happen again because yeah, they, and, they know they how, so what they brutal. did. You, know, you look at yeah. Cuba and you look at the Soviet Union, you look at North Korea, especially, you know, mm-hmm. China, yeah. where how many people died because of the revolution because they were turning against the revolution. Right. On the other hand, some revolutions end up working out like the American Revolution. It, that's right. Yeah. It did. Yeah. So um, it's the it's the way the way you revolt matters mm-hmm. certainly, you know, the, and the, what you do afterwards. Exactly, which is the doctor's point. If I had been in Bonnie's position, and the doctor's like, "So what are you going to do after you've made society perfect?" Is like, well, nothing lasts forever, but that doesn't mean we can't do good while we have the opportunity. So revolt on. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Um. So uh, at the end of this. Bonnie is ready to change, but but she does admit, I'm unforgivable. What I've done is so bad, it can't be forgiven. And the doctor does just tells her, I forgive you. And that's, I, I you know, I think that's a, a strong moment in, in to, to show, I mean, Bonnie is really bad in, throughout these two episodes. I mean, she is, she's evil. And then in the end, she like, and I know the, the conversion to the new Osgood is it's, quick. It's so, and her yeah. backing down is, is very quick, but yeah. I can, I'm more forgiving of that. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's only two, only two episodes and I, I, I agree it's way too quick, but you know, given the dramatic limitations yeah. of the, of the, the format, mm-hmm. but um, nevertheless, I really, I like that we have this deep conversion that it's for, he forgives her and that forgiveness unlocks the, her ability to change and which says anybody can change. I really, I really like that. She's got a very Pauline moment here where she gets figuratively knocked off her horse. So I thought that was, I, I really like that. Ass. Gets knocked <laughs> off her ass. Horses were ridden for purposes of war. Asses were, asses were normal riding animals. That, that was what Paul was riding on the way to Damascus. It, it doesn't say, but that's what it should, that's the okay. most reason. He's not going to be riding a war horse. No, that's true. And that's he, true. And he was Paul in a hurry, was not. so he wasn't going to walk. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, he was knocked down anyway, but yeah, yeah, but yeah probably off of an, of an ass. And um, by the way, it's at this point that um, Kate, you know, after the boxes have been revealed to be impotent, Kate, you know, talks, questions how they're going to keep the peace in the future. Now she says that we know the box, because we know the boxes are empty now. And it's at that point the doctor says, you said that the last 15 times, and then he wipes Kate's memory, but not Bonnie's. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that this would be a reference to 15 previous occasions, not just now, but previous failures. Um, Because otherwise, if he had just wiped Kate's memory 14 times or 15 times just now, Bonnie would have remembered those. Well, unless he yeah, erased unless he, unless he'd been wiping Bonnie's yeah. too, but he he yes. Anyway, it's 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 unclear writing. Yeah, see, mm-hmm. it's it's unclear. But the way I the way I read it is because Bonnie had that conversion. This was the first why conversion. Why he didn't wipers the last time? But it was still right. you know both of them had gone through fourteen times. Fourteen times, one of them pushed a button, and of course nothing happened. 
And right. then he wiped them and repeat mm-hmm. and repeat until finally Bonnie had the change of heart. Right. Where right. Kate really didn't need it. Kate just was seeing herself as defending humanity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, or at least one until one of them changed, I guess, is the, is yeah. the, is the, the way to go. Yeah, that's true. Um, so at, you know, after, you know, everything is done there and we have the denouement and, uh, the, they, they go to the TARDIS and Osgood asks the doctor, what does TARDIS stand for? And he says, and he's kind of flabbergasted, sure, you know, surely, you know that. And she says, I've heard a couple of variations. What, why would, what is, what is that so a reference to? It's a reference to the fact that the, the show has been inconsistent in what TARDIS stands for. Oh, okay. It has stood for time and relative dimension in space. Mm-hmm. And it has stood for time and relative dimensions in space. So it's an extremely subtle point they're making. Uh. I actually think this is a great bit of dialogue because, you know, she asks, so what does TARDIS stand for? And the doctor is flabbergasted. And for anyone who is not a, this is an extremely deep cut. Yeah. And and for anyone who's not extremely knowledgeable about the history of the franchise, it's going to sound like what you don't know that. Yeah. And right. it, and so the casual fans are going to have the exact same reaction the doctor does. Yeah. And then just very subtly, she says, "I've heard a couple of different versions, and they're almost identical, but they don't go into that." So this is yeah. very subtle writing. Well, yeah. and, and then then you have kind of more the modern trend of viewing TARDIS as a proper name, not a Right. Acronym, right, right. Where it's it, capital T, low, lowercase a r d i s. Yeah, that's and, you know, true. And that's how they do it in like closed captioning or whatever. So they don't view it as having meaning anything other than that's just its name is TARDIS. <gasps> the doctor also says he made it up, which is different than what is said in An Unearthly Child, where it said that Susan made it up. Yeah, although he might be being sarcastic because he says he made it up from totally yeah. and radically driving in space. Yeah, uh, yeah. Speaking of acronyms, in Britain, uh, they when they do acronyms, they don't capitalize all the letters. They only capitalize the first. So I've, I've noticed that. So that might be also why in the closed captions like that. Um, so to yeah. an American eye, USA would look like USA in Britain, in British typography. Yeah, or NASA. Like um, if you ever see uh, like the BBC t- uh, t- uh, writing about NASA, it's capital N, lowercase A-S-A. I don't know if I've ever noticed that. Interesting. Yeah. I've usually seen the acronyms spelled out. Like they yeah. spelled UK, not capital U, lowercase K. I think for countries it's different, but oh. for, for other acronyms, I think they, they, they do the I, upper I saw a, Anyways. a few episodes of a cartoon news show, that a comedy news show that was hosted by aliens, mm. and they would talk about Earth Sector USA and Earth Sector Ook. <laughs> 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 At least it wasn't Uck. Um so and then we end with the uh, this this the second Osgood Bonnie becoming the second Osgood and then the question the doctor keeps asking you know human or Zygon human or Zygon and it's possible that there are two Zygons there that the, yeah. the human Bonnie mm-hmm. is, has has died has and died, yeah. you know the day nobody cares about the answer I mean it's just being a little um, uh, well they're, they're being and clever too because the actress herself has said that she's picked which is which. And won't say. Okay. So I think this is being a little too clever for their own good. Yeah. It's, I, I, yeah. Can, I can accept it. It's not my favorite thing, but I, but I can accept it. Um, it's, so originally there was a human Osgood, and then there was a Zygon Osgood alongside of her. And then one of those two got killed by Missy. Mm-hmm. And now the um, there's a, 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 another Zygon Osgood, but we don't know whether it was the human Osgood or the Zygon Osgood, the original Zygon Osgood that was killed by Missy. Right. So it could be there's a human and a Zygon, or it could be there's two Zygons. Yeah. Um, and... And Osgood's, when the doctor asks her for the final time about that, and the reason she doesn't say is her point is it doesn't matter. I'm committed. I'm who I am. I'm going to do what I'm going to do regardless Mm -hmm. of my species. And so she's here to guard the peace between the two species. And one of the ways she does that is by not letting anyone know which one she is. Um, but she says, I'll answer that question one day. And when that will be is when no one cares about the answer. Right. Right. Um, 
And there's the doctor, also, the doctor then says you're a credit to your species, and the two Osgoods say no, we're a credit to both species. Right. And then he says, "I'm a very big fan." <laughs> Although you you could make the argument that the one whose glasses got broken in this episode was human because the glasses come with the the Zygon transformation. That's true. That's I mean that, that's that's that. I mean that's oh, trying it's a to reach. Be, again, yes. trying to be clever, but also yeah. for artistic reasons, the human needs we need a human Zygon pair. So since Bonnie is definitely a Zygon, that tells us the uh, for artistic reasons the other is really the human. Yeah. yeah, and who, despite the fact her race was invaded, has been serving the interests of both races. Mm-hmm. And they could always, if Stephen Moffat was doing it, he could come back and and say, "No, they're both Zygons," but logically yeah. there is a zygon and a human That's... here and the and therefore the original osgood in this episode is the human yeah. yep. we'll see if maybe russell t davies will re- resurrect this in the yeah because this is this last time 15th. we see on tv the yeah. osgoods no, although they are they finished start, it a bunch yeah. yeah they're also starting a unit uh a unit spinoff series so osgood mm-hmm. may be in that that would be fun. which i hope so that'd yeah, be great that would be really good um also, the doctor at one point when asks Osgood's first name and she tells him her name's Petronella, uh, he says his first name is Basil. And so yeah. she <laughs> refers to him as Basil at the end, which was fun. Uh, any final thoughts on Petronella this episode? Petronella is a cool name. It's also I, the name of a dance move. Oh, nice. is it? That's funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it sounded like Citronella to me, which is kind of funny. But yeah. um, uh, final thoughts, Father Corey? Uh, well, as they're, the doctor's doing his big speech there in the, the Black Archives, there's the mask that was put on Ash Hilder to take care of the aliens. That mm. the big metal mask was sitting back there, a big That's metal that was. helmet right. was sitting back there. And then I had to laugh. So I was in Italy recently and drove uh, part of my group around in a van which was pretty much the same model of Volkswagen transporter van that the doctor was driving. <laughs> That's funny. And it squeals out and cranks around corners and stuff. They're gutless wonders. They don't do that. They can't do that. <laughs> yeah. They can't get out of its own way. No, I just, I just had to kind of laugh when I saw the Volkswagen van. It's like, I drove one. I just drove one of those. They're not that good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's when he was like first extolling the virtues of London. And then like two minutes later, t- t- talking about what a dump it is. I, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jimmy, final thoughts? So at one point in this episode, uh, as Clara is asserting some degree of control over Bonnie, she is um, she's causing one of Bonnie's eyes to wink without Bonnie even being aware of it. Mm-hmm. And they're doing a FaceTime with the doctor, and the doctor is picking up on the winking, and they start using it as a method of communication. And, um, eventually Bonnie has to like hold her hand in front of her (laughs) eyes. So the doctor can't see whether she's blinking or not. But I thought that was a, an effective, uh, form of communication that they were able to establish. Um, a bit on a less pleasant note, the doctor during the wind up to the big war speech at the beginning of it, once we have the two boxes with the two buttons, the doctor goes into this game show routine. Mm-hmm. And as part of his game show routine, he adopts a bad, fake American Southern accent. And it's very brief, but it's yeah. there. And it's like, uh, dude, your accent needs work. And why? <laughs> there aren't a lot of Southern game show hosts on TV. No. I think it's um, just but, Capaldi's yeah. lack of, <laughs> of doing, well, being able to do an accent. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it should have been more of a Midwestern accent because that... For yeah. a long time, was for American TV. That's why you know Bob Barker. He's from South Dakota. You know, yeah. right? Things like no, that. No, and yes, and Midwestern accents tend to be what you hear on game shows in America. And given that there is a game show mentioned in this sequence, they should mm-hmm. in this two parter. They should have. They missed an opportunity. The the doctor once the boxes are revealed and their buttons, the doctor uh, should have said. And welcome, everybody. Now, let's play Truth or Consequences. <laughs> right, right. That should have been... Uh, yeah, that, that's the obvious line that they should have used. That's true. Yeah. Also, I found it interesting that we had this rebellion that then they backed down from very quickly. 
Mm-hmm. On the same weekend we're recording this uh, as the recent <laughs> Russian oh, yeah. Wagner insurrection that then backed down within 24 hours. Yeah. Yes. Maybe the doctor showed up with a couple boxes. Yeah. <laughs> or gave, him, gave him to the premier of Bel- Belarus. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he uh, told him about the, uh, the don't stand near any windows, he said to uh, Prigozhin. <laughs> yeah, and if yeah. I were Prigozhin, I was like, dude, you know, you just signed your death warrant. <laughs> Yes, you may falls. go and you may go to Belarus for a while, but Putin yeah. is going to have you killed. He's going to get a little radioactive thing and have it slip to you, yeah. and you're going to die like those other people. Because and 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 because he's he's got to make an example of what happens to rebellious mm-hmm. people. Yeah, or uh, there's been a rash of uh, Russian tycoons falling out of windows yeah. uh, to their to their death, uh, which mm. is kind of big coincidence. Anyway. Um, which leads to a, one of the best words in English called, that we borrow from French called defenestration. Defenestration. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. So that tangent aside, let's uh, move on to some feedback from listeners. And we have a, a little bit of feedback from our recent episode on the fourth Doctor story, Face of Evil. And this came in from Ted via email who said it was mentioned on the show that Leela was the first person to get on the TARDIS without the Doctor's approval. I think that Stephen in the second Doctor's time was a stowaway. Yeah, they, Stephen was a stowaway. Yeah, which yeah, they, is they, ironic, they, they given that ret- we just talked about that. <laughs> they just kind of retconned him in when they decided, hey, we actually need him as a companion instead of just leaving him on the, the yeah. me- mechanoids planet. That's right, that's right. So uh, thanks for pointing that out, Ted. That was a good catch. Um, oh, and then he also says, uh, how many times would Leela have to try to kill you before you would refuse to take her on as a companion? My number is pretty high, and I would I would agree <laughs> um, with that as well. I'm a little more security conscious. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't is take cute. people, I don't associate with people who've tried to kill me. <laughs> no. She's, she's pretty cute, though. I mean, I got to yeah. say, if you're, oh, yeah. if you're a young single man, I mean, that would be, the, your, your level of tolerance for that might be high. All right. Uh, so thank you, Ted, again. And w- before we go, we want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Doctor Who, including Mihovil P, Paula C, Les H, Andrew G, and John S. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Doctor Who and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And we'd also like to thank Simon Yannick, who edited this episode for us. So that's it from us this time. We'd love to know what you think of the Zygon inversion, and you can do that by commenting on the show at sqpn.com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page, or send an email to Who at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. You can watch The Secrets of Doctor Who on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash starquestmedia, where you can also leave a comment, but you should also subscribe and click the bell to make sure you get notifications of new episodes. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the Big Finish River Song story, My Dinner with Andrew. Until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing The Secrets of Doctor Who. Thank you, Dom. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. And remember, thank you for listening to The Secrets of Dark to Who on StarQuest. And remember, you think I've done this a few times. You don't invade a planet without a plan. That's why they're called planets. To remind you to plan it. <laughs>